morning, everyone. And today in the lecture for parapsychology, we are going to discuss infections, which are called as teniasis. And what are teniasis? Teniasis are simply the worms which live in the intestines or which causes intestinal infection. And uh, in teniasis, two most important organisms, or you can say parasites, which we are going to study, one is called as tenia saginata and one is called as tenia solium. So, I would like to talk about the background first of all about these two conditions and then we are going to talk about um, like these two worms. As you know, we are still in cystodes, right? We are discussing cystodes. And in the previous lecture, I talked about diaphylobotrum latum, right? which have like uh, the life cycle in the humans and in the fish and in the cyclops. So, okay. So talking about the teniasis, okay. So uh, by the way, uh, the conditions which are related with these two organisms, which we are going to study today, one is called as teniasis and one is called as um, cyte uh, or cytic cystic kirosis. Uh, now, wh why, what is this cystic kirosis like? You will understand when we are going to discuss these things in detail. So, <laughs> simply this teniasis or uh, and um, sorry, this is cystic kirosis, okay? Uh, cystic kirosis. So, cystic kirosis means like, remember, it, it comes from the cyst, okay? So, cystic kirosis, you know, they are the diseases which results from infection with the tapeworms of tenia species, okay? And uh, there are many um, species of tenia which are identified, but of course, like, we are not, like, there are around 45 species, right? So, of course, like, we, we are not going to discuss 45 species, but uh, we are going to discuss, like, two uh, which causes human infection, and that is... Um, Tenia solium and the other one is Tenia uh, saginata. Okay, uh, now uh, this Tenia solium is also called as pork, uh, we can say pork tapeworm. Okay, this is the common name, uh, pork, pork tapeworm, and this one is also called as uh, beef tapeworm, saginata. Uh, now, you know. Um, there is a very easy way to remember like how why like how we can remember that it is beef and this one is pork so remember p o this o and in solium the second o is common so but this is how i remember like uh, uh, solium s o so pork p o so o o so like this one is the one which is pork and the other one is beef uh, so simply uh, tenia solium uh, is also called as pork tapeworm or tenia saginata is also called as beef tapeworm. So uh, their distribution is worldwide of course and they cause sickness, malnutrition and they often, particularly this one, solium, they often result in the death of their host which in this case why we are discussing because we are discussing human infections. Uh, so simply whenever like the person uh, they get infection with the adult tapeworms of either of these kinds or when the adults, you know, they get infection from tenia, we call that condition as teniasis. So, now, what is cyst cystosclerosis is simply uh, the metacystode or the, which, or we can say the larval stage of this one Tenia solium. They causes tissue infection, and they causes they form cyst. That's why we also call it as cystic kirosis, right? So, of course, we are going to discuss the clinical manifestations, okay, associated with the tapeworm infection, and of course, like they 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 there is a lot of variations in the presentation of the patient, which can range from mild form 
where the patient have almost little or no symptoms to severe life-threatening forms which are often fatal and can cause death okay so uh, TB infections are estimated to affect you can say 100 million people worldwide it's a very 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 common thing right so 100 million people worldwide you know, are affected by the flu and uh, <laughs> if you're familiar with the terms what is endemic what is epidemic what is pandemic and I'm sure like nowadays all, almost everyone knows about these terms and not just the medical students rather the doctor like the general population as well so most of these infections basically occur in the developing countries like uh, South America Africa Southeast Asia, China, uh, as well as India. So, and why we have this condition? Because you know they they eat raw or undercooked meat, uh, which causes the transmission of this this uh, tape form from the pigs to the human. Uh, simply. Um, now, uh, TB infections are less common in developed countries, but uh, it's not like this, like it, it never occurs, of course it do occur. For example, I will tell you, in California, this uh, neurocysty uh, chirosis is a recognized health problem. So, uh, and most of the people, you know, who get these kind of tradition in America, they are basically migrant workers from Latin America. So that's still the main point. Yeah. Um, to talk about more, uh, <coughs> like Tibia uh, saginata, you know, because like that is the uh, derived from the beef, you know. its distribution is more worldwide than the tinea solium because there are many countries uh, which uh, consider pork as a taboo uh, they don't eat they don't sell so uh, i can name many countries you know like where this disease has not existed uh, like they ne people never get because you know uh, pork they don't eat at all rather uh, even to sell the meat of pork is banned. There are many countries uh, which have this thing. So, uh, as you know, like we have already discussed what you can say, uh, the morphology of the cystodes, but okay, just for a revision, um, like uh, I can show you uh, a photograph, again, to tell you, to make you how they look like. Uh, for example, you can see this one. Uh, this is a uh, tinea saginata. Okay. Uh, the difference between uh, <laughs> tinea saginata and the tinea solium is simply uh, these are the suckers. Okay. A tinea solium and tinea saginata, both of them, they have suckers, but tinea solium also have two rows of booklets. Um, again, I will show you uh, the, the the picture. Uh, see this one. This is also tinea saginata. And if I will uh, show you tinea solium, for example, uh, there is a very mild difference in these two. Uh, yes, this one. So you can see. Uh, it has the hooklets. There is two rows, rows of hooklets. Okay. So they are white in color. They are, they are ribbon-like and they are flattened they are segmented you can see the segments over here okay so of course like all these features we have discussed in the previous lecture but like just for revision I'm uh, talking about them like see this is how they look like by the way okay so they are segmented and they have a head they have head is also called a scolex they have the neck and they have the body which is also called a strobila and the uh, scolex or the head have again the same thing the 
suckers and uh, hook hooker okay so now uh, Tinea solium can lead to the formation of the cyst or can lead to fetal infections, as I told you before. That's why, because uh, you can say like this thing that Tinea saginata is, uh, you can say, uh, uh, unarmed because it has like one, uh, one thing less, you can say, one, uh, simply, uh, you can see from here, the saginata don't have the hooker, but this one have extra thing, which is hooker. So this, this, sorry, this uh, hook, hookers, yes, yeah, so uh, uh, this one serves, you know, uh, the sole organ of attachment. So, of course, like uh, uh, you can see over here, uh, they, they, like in this picture, you can see many, many of the photographs of these, uh, how they look like in reality. Okay. So, uh, now... The adult form of this worm can be um, two to three uh, meters long, you know, which is quite long, okay? And uh, like uh, you can see, okay, okay, and after that, you know, I, what I can sh talk about is uh, you can say the difference between uh, Tinea solium and Tinea saginata. Uh, if you can see over here, like this is Tinea saginata, this is Tinea solium like the length of saginata is quite longer than the solium and i told you scolex it have large one it have small one the hooks are absent in this one the hooks are present in this one uh, this difference is not so important like the suckers may be pigmented or not pigmented neck is long neck is short and uh, measurements are written and it expelled singly it expelled passively in chains of five or six okay so uh, this is how, like, uh, what you can say they are present. Like in the vagina, like they have present and absent, and accessory lobe of ovary absent present. So many differences are there, of course. Like you can see over here. Okay, eggs are not effective to man, but in Stenia solium, the eggs are effective to man. So th this is an important point. And both of them, their definitive host is man, and the intermediate host is a host, as you know, a saginata uh, is beef, or so cow or solium. Uh, remember O oh, pork so of course pig okay and the main difference is like this one just cause intestinal infection solium can cause intestinal teniasis and cysticirosis like uh, cysticirosis like whatever you, you, you can you can say so now uh, when we know this thing so <laughs> The eggs of both of these uh, things, you know, uh, they are, they look same. They are spherical. Okay, they, they are same. Uh, like when we look under the microscope, all of, both of them, they have same thing. And you can see like the larva, it is cysti, curus, bovis, here it is cellulase. So present in corn, not in man. So that's why this one can only uh, have, uh, can survive in cow okay but cellulose of course it is present in pig and also in man so that's why you can say intermediate host of can, host can be pig and can be man so um like this is the main differences between these things and uh, let's discuss the life cycle of these things uh, you can see like here they have given uh, saginata as well as the solium uh, saginata don't have the hooklets and this one have the hooklets and the adults are in small intestine so the story uh, starts from the eggs or gravid proglottids and feces and parts into, into the environment and what are these proglottids uh, are basically uh, they are around less than 1000 in number and they resemble uh, those of like both of them they are almost same okay and uh, <clears throat> what happened like whenever these eggs are released you know these proglottids are released you know they are the one who make, which make eggs right and when the eggs are formed so cattle in the case of saginata and pigs in the case of solium they become infected by ingesting vegetation contaminated by eggs or gravid uh, remember what is gravid gravid means like you know uh, like uh, 
they are they are carrying the babies you can say okay so they are taken by the pigs and or in the case of solium and uh, cows in the case of serginata uh, so what happens is the definitive host are uh, humans and the intermediate host like if i will, will talk about serginata is cow okay and <laughs> One thing uh, which I like about the CDC diagrams is like, see, you can say the infective stage. So here is the infective stage, okay? Here is the infective stage. And this is the diagnostic stage, D. Okay, so this is the diagnostic stage, this is the infective stage. I and this is D, okay? So, the adult worms, they live in the in small intestine of the man, okay? and in the case of Saginata, they are expelled, as I told you, individually, but in the case of Solium, they are expelled in a form of a, you can say, bundle. So, what happens is, um, uh, like, once they are released uh, from the humans, uh, what happens is, uh, <clears throat> so, okay, so once they are released, you know, from the humans, uh, what happens is like uh, uh, these embryonated eggs, you know, they when they are passed uh, in the feces, uh, so what happens like, uh, of course, like they can contaminate the grass or anything which is, which they feed on. And once what you can say, like they feed on that thing, they can uh, have these eggs inside them. Okay. And uh, what happens is like simply, then they penetrate their intestinal wall and circulate in their blood and reach to their muscles. Okay, and once you know they will reach their muscles, uh, you can see like oncospheres develop into cysticerca in muscles. Okay, so once you know they are going to, uh, you can say, reach the muscles of these animals. Uh, of course, like what we feed on, we, we, we eat the meat or, or the muscles simply. So, th like this one is the one which is called as proglottids, you can see over here. Okay, so both the proglottids and the eggs are released with the feces of infected individual. And it is the one which serves as a uh, source of infection to the, for the pigs and the cattle which are acting as an intermediate host. And uh, of course, like after the ingestion of the eggs, they, they inside them, they mature, and they are called as oncospheres, this one, oncospheres. So all these oncospheres are released in their gut, okay? And these oncospheres, they penetrate the intestinal wall, they enter the blood circulation, and uh, once they enter the blood circulation, you know, they can reach to the skeletal muscles, to the cardiac muscles, and can develop uh, cysti, cysti, cirque in the muscles. So, now the bad thing is, like, these cysti, cirque can survive in the host tissues for several years, causing cysti, circosis. So, the consumption of the raw or undercooked meat, uh, if you know, uh, whenever we go for, uh, um, for example, to the restaurants and we, we eat steak, you know, so uh, they ask us, like, either it should be full done, it should be half done, or it should be mildly done. At that the level of the cooking, they, like, heat or if you if you ask full done like they will cook it deep inside if you will say mildly done so it will be brown from the outside but inside the color will be red so uh, whenever we consume raw or undercooked meat uh, so they have this thing cysti circa in them okay so once it is ingested you know they can reach the intestine and they can stay in the intestine for years so, 
it takes like around you can say two months you know for the initial infection to develop into an adult worm okay so uh, of course like uh, this is how okay one of the thing like you can the chances are very less, but in some instances, you can say, uh, infected in, in like the person who is harboring the adult forms can become auto-infected uh, when they accidentally ingest the eggs releasing the feces, or that is simply uh, fecal oral transmission. Like, of course, when you don't wash your hands uh, nicely, you know, uh, so this thing can occur. That's the reason. So, uh, now, uh, they, they, they produce, you can say, a lot of eggs, you know, in the intestines, um, as many as 300,000 per day, okay? And that's the reason, you know, uh, uh, what you can say, uh, that's the reason, you know, like, uh, like whenever like the contamination is there, so there are high chances, if we are not going to cook it properly, that we can ingest the thing, uh, and we can have, we can have this uh, organism, right? Uh, okay, now, uh, the intestinal infection with tinea solium, which occurs in the people who consume pork, okay, uh, what happens like this tinea solium, okay, uh, like the larva stage of that tinea solium, uh, which I was showing you over here the larva stage have cysty circus cellul lazy right this one so what happens like once it will enter the blood circulation once this one will enter the blood circulation so from the blood it can reach to uh, practically speaking any part of the human body um, it can affect the eyes, it can affect the brain, it can affect the muscles, it can affect the heart, it can affect the lungs, it can affect like anything. Because remember guys, when something is in the blood, uh, it can reach anywhere, simply. Okay, that's luck. Or that's, that depends on uh, which organ is getting more blood supply. Like brain gets a lot of blood supply kidney gets a lot of blood supply so all this uh, what you can say these things can reach anywhere in the body so what happens is the like once it reached to the other parts of the body now I'm talking about tinea solium guys the larva it start a cellular reaction again if you had done immunity I think you must have the concept of this thing uh, Whenever we have any infection from anything in the body, what happens, the first thing which arrives over there is neutrophils, you know, and then plasma cells and giant cells and all these things, okay. So, uh, what happens, like when this is the case, of course, uh, they kill the larva and uh, they, like, chronically there will be fibrosis over there and eventual calcification will be there so now 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 how this tinea solium clinical representation will be uh, completely depends on uh, what you can say where the uh, larva is reaching for example it can cause subcutaneous nodules which are basically asymptomatic. It can cause muscular, when it reaches the muscle, cystic fibrosis, okay, uh, which can cause myositis or inflammation of the muscle. Now, now, the bad complication of this condition, which I wanted to talk about, is this thing neuro um, cystic fibrosis, okay. And now, this is something which is important in this one. Uh, like remember it is neuro so it is related to the brain and it is the most serious uh, and you can say the most common 
manifestation of this condition. Uh, now, you know, now remember guys, there is a cyst in the brain, okay? Now there is what? There is a cyst in the brain. So the patient can present with epilepsy. Okay. Uh, the patients can present with um, any other conditions like psychiatric manifestations. Okay. The, uh, the patient can present with um, hydrocephalus. The patient can present with meningitis or encephalitis or like collectively we can call it as a meningoencephalitis. Okay. Uh, the patient can, like depending on which part of the brain is damaged, they may have visual disturbances. Uh, they may have uh, uh, what you can say, aphasia, um, many other things. So, uh, of course, like this is something dangerous because now uh, the brain can is involved and of course uh, whenever the brain is involved the consequences will be bad it can also call ocular um, cysty by the way what we are discussing right now is um, cysty cirrhosis right cirrhosis so uh, whenever it affects the eyes it will cause cysty ocular cirrhosis okay so of course like the cyst will form in the uh, inside the eye or you can say inside the vitreous femur it could be in the retina it could be in the conjunctiva so the patient will present with blood vision and loss of vision uveitis and things like this so uh, now uh, the important thing here to uh, talk about is of course uh, uh, once the patient have this uh, you can say uh, <laughs> like uh, neurocystic cirrhosis so of course like the thing is not easy now anymore of course like now the brain is involved so uh, it is quite subtle condition uh, again guys like you know of course it's not the lecture of immunology but uh, uh, again it's my suggestion for you guys to at least do immunology in detail Many of the things, especially in internal medicine, you, you need the help of neurology, immunology to understand. By the way, in medicine, everything is important. So, uh, because again, you know, like there are many immunological things which are going on whenever we are infected. For example, whenever there is uh, infection with the tapeworm, which is in the small intestine, you know, um, it is going to cause, you can say, uh, the immune response when you will found high level of interleukins levels like I interleukin 4 or interleukin 10 and there will be uh, immunoglobulin production which is primarily IgG type and antibodies will be produced you know uh, against that parasitic antigens and of course like they will go and they will destroy the larva of course so uh, but like, like you know like when there is a cyst formation in the, in the muscles or anywhere in the body of course then this way they cannot kill the parasite so uh, what like what they have found is like you know whenever there is cyst formation there is little or no inflammation uh, at all you can say uh, so that's why you know they can they can stay and they can cause problems so now uh, like immunity is very 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 important uh, so <laughs> now uh, the important thing is uh, Talking about the sign and symptom, for example, of this one, you know, uh, tediasis, um, because we have done two conditions, you can say, uh, see, when, when I say about tediasis, okay, if I'm saying that we are discussing tediasis, so remember I'm talking about not just one, like both, okay, uh, because tediasis is what, like, uh, when, the, when when these uh, tape forms are causing infection to the intestine, of course, like so both of them they are involved, right? But whenever I'm saying cystopirosis, so remember it is tinea solium only, this will cause that. So, uh, when, whenever the infection is tinea acid, of course, it is just confined to the small intestine, okay? So, uh, just confined uh, to the small uh, intestine, of course, like in this case, right? So, 
course, like what when, whenever it, just, it is just in the small intestine, what can happen? You know, there will be GIT, gastrointestinal tract irritation, will be caused, right? And uh, whenever there is GIT irritation, what we get? The patient can present with nausea, the patient can present with vomiting, okay? The patient can present with diarrhea, the patient can present with constipation. But see, all these things are just related to G GIT, okay? Hunger pains can be there, okay? And uh, just, you can say, typical symptoms of GIT will be there, okay? So, uh, now, one of the things, you know, a very important clinical finding, these features are more common with the infection from what? Tinea saginata, okay? So, GIT symptoms are more common uh, with tinea saginata, okay? Now, which means tinea saginata give more of the GIT symptoms, but tinea solium give less of these symptoms, but tinea solium can cause a more dangerous type of condition, which is cystic fibrosis, right? So, uh, like this one, these cysts, you know, they are formed by metacystores, or you can say in the larval, larva stage. And uh, what happens, like, uh, uh, like whenever this, this thing occurs, of course, like there will be an inflammatory response, okay, of course, to control the parasite growth, and uh, it may uh, take months to develop this thing, of course. So, uh, but what happens, like, uh, uh, depending on, like, where the things reach, as I was talking about, it could be ocular, okay. So, when I say ocular, it could be intraocular, it could be extraocular. Extraocular means like surrounding the eye, or you can say the eye muscles, for example. So, of course, like in this case, in the, this one, you know, the patient, they suffer from um, pain in the eyes, or blurry vision, or partial or complete loss of vision, okay. In extreme cases, it can lead to detachment of the retina. So, that thing is important. So, muscular cystic cirrhosis is like when it reaches the skeletal muscles, uh, subcutaneous one when it reaches the subcutaneous tissues, but they are like often asymptomatic, like they are not going to cause that much problem, right? So, uh, whenever it is cystic cirrhosis, uh, it is the one which is the most common and the most serious one, which I already talked about. And now, the, the, remember, the condition is related to brain. So, of course, like, when it is related, related to brain, like, anything related to brain is quite serious. So, uh, the cyst size, you know, in brain, which we see on imaging, can, can range from any size, like, up to 2 centimeter, you can say. Uh, but most commonly, the size is around 8 to 10 millimeter. So, uh, the most common symptom is seizures, okay, or epilepsy, you can say. Uh, by the way, seizure is the correct word here. Seizures, okay. Seizures, seizures. So, this is the most common presentation of this condition. Headache can occur, dizziness can occur, and many other things can occur, of course, right, uh, in these patients who have cystic fibrosis. So, uh, now, uh, like, uh, how we diagnose these patients, okay? Uh, for the diagnosis, again, I will show you the lab diagnosis thing, okay? Uh, and, again, guys, when I'm talking about all the investigations over here, it doesn't mean, like, they do all these investigations. It's not like this, okay? Uh, rather... Uh, you can say, okay, here, like, one more CDC, you know, taken from the CDC and infective stage as well as the diagnostic stage. So you can see, like, when it's infecting the human, it is both 
uh, effective as well as diagnostic stage by the way. So coming back to this one, uh, you can see uh, lab diagnosis they have divided into two main categories, kidney acid and cystic process. It doesn't mean we are going to do all the tests, but like we are going to choose some of the tests. For example, if you will look for the first one, stool examination. Now, stool examination is a quite common test. Uh, many of the times, you know, we send the patient's stool for to the labs to check for any type of infection, eggs, or abnormalities we can find. So, whenever they are going to check the eggs, you know, they can found on microscopic examination the in the feces they can found the eggs. Okay, and. Uh, Again, like uh, the species identification is very hard to do from the eggs because, as I told you, uh, Tinea solium as well as uh, Tinea saginata, you know, they have almost, you can say, the same uh, morphological, morphological is the same eggs. So, when it is at proglottid stage, uh, so of course, like uh, at this stage, you can say the differentiation can be made by looking at the proglottids. Uh, for example, uh, they see like in Tinea saginata, they have like 15 to 20 literal branches, whereas in Tinea solium, they have like under 13 literal branches. And also you can see the scolex, because the scolex uh, of Tinea solium have the hooklets, right? So that's the important thing. Uh, now on the feces, we can also do the examinations or uh, investigations to catch the antigen in the feces. And how we can catch the antigen, guys, a very important way is to do ELISA. Okay, so ELISA can be done to catch the antigens in the feces related to teniasis. And whenever it is teniasis, just the intestinal infection, we can do serological testing like ELISA as well as um, indirect hema A globulin test. And even the molecular diagnosis can be done by checking the DNA by PCR. And uh, of course, like when, when we are going for PCR, so we can completely uh, catch what kind of species there are, either it is saginata or it is tinea solium. When it's come to cystic cirrhosis, you know, cystic cirrhosis, so uh, the most important test is this one, biopsy. So biopsy, if you know, like, you know, biopsy, that's what it's written, you know, the definitive method of diagnosis. So, of course, biopsy is like when you are going to take the tissue and see it under a microscope, how it looks like. So of course, like you will be sure that okay, this thing is a is a thing which it is affecting the patient. For example, if you found the hooklets, if you are finding like the suckers only, so the thing will be easy. Rest of the investigation, of course, X-rays can be done, CT scan of the brain can be done, MRI scan can be done, and simply. They are going to show you either there is any um, cyst formation is there or not and of course like serological tests are always there so what is logical test which we can do we can detect the antigens by again ELISA or EITB is basically enzyme linked immuno electro transfer blot test ELISA is the best test, anyways, uh, uh, we can do that, that, that thing, okay. Uh, so, of course, like, uh, depending on, like, which area uh, it is affecting, we can, we can diagnose that. So, diagnosis is sometimes difficult, 
due to non-specific, you can say, um, nature of the symptom uh, associated with specialty cystic cirrhosis. So most of the time, you know, in this case, the diagnosis is made on what we found clinically, then, then we run uh, serological testing and then we see epidemiological data. Like, uh, as I told you, for example, in India, cystic cirrhosis is common. And of course, like whenever like we are having neurocystic cirrhosis, so we directly go for MRI or CT scan, uh, of course, like to see what's going on. And uh, ELISA and EITB or enzyme-linked immunoelectrotransfer blot can be done. So this one is, of course, like simply they, they are the test to uh, detect the antigens, okay? So what you can say? Now, by the way, this EITB is highly sensitive, guys. A very important point to remember, yeah. And it is the best immunological diagnostic test available for this one. Okay. But, uh, uh, so it is highly sensitive, okay. So, ELISA is not that much sensitive, so EITB is more sensitive in these patients. So, these tests can be done. And once we have done the diagnosis, of course, what is left is the treatment. So, how we treat these patients, okay, treatment of cystic cirrhosis. Now, <laughs> when it comes to the treatment, uh, you know, uh, one drug which, if you will ask me to remember the name for the worms is albendazole. It is used like when I was working in my country, you know, in pediatrics especially, I don't remember even one day when I don't write albendazole because I was working in a government hospital and uh, like in, in our country, most of the people who are not so well off, you know, they, they, they go to the government hospitals. So many of the babies, you know, they come due to uh, anemias, okay? And whenever they come due to anemias, you know, we always deworm them. Deworm means like we give them some drugs to kill if they have any worms in the intestine. So I don't remember even one day when I did not write albendazole. When you will study pharmacology, of course, you will study about albendazole. So two, two drugs which can be used in these patients is one is called as praziquantel and one is called as albendazole. So these two drugs can be used to treat the patient diagnosed with cysticirrhosis in the brain or in the skeletal muscles. So basically the treatment is given for a long time, you know, whenever it is cysticirrhosis. We give Prezzyquintel or Albendazole for around 30 days. Daily for 30 days. And when we give these drugs for 30 days, you know, it shows, the research shows like it, it, it eliminates the, what you can say, the cyst in 80% of the patients. So, the good thing is you don't have to remember the doses and stuff. So, <clears throat> of course, there are side effects of these drugs as well, but like, cystic is a very, very, very dangerous type of condition. Could be. So, uh, now, guys, you know, one of the thing is uh, that uh, whenever we give these uh, drugs, you know, and they, uh, what you can say, Kill the, start killing the parasites, okay? So what happens like uh, when massively the parasites are, are, are destroyed by the drugs, okay? So the fight is going on inside the body. So there is a host immune response as well. So 
due to that host immune response, what happens is like uh, uh, there could be many of the sign and symptoms due to that in the body. So that's why sometimes we do we also give them dexamethasone, which is a steroid. Okay, so dexamethasone is a steroid, a corticosteroid. Uh, we often, not always, we sometimes give them with these drugs, okay. Uh, so dexamethasone or prednisone, whatever, like, is needed, you know, we can give. And of course, if someone is presenting with seizures, so for seizures, uh, give an anti-epileptic uh, medication, okay. Of course, like, to... to control the seizures so like of course this one is like for neuro neurocystic so now uh, remember it is about the cyst so if the cyst cannot be removed by the uh, medication so surgical uh, removal of the cyst can be done as well okay so uh, well, like before the development of these drugs you know this was the only sole method to treat these patients but nowadays, because we have these drugs, so uh, the use of this surgery is not not needed most of the time. Okay, so nowadays you can say a very less commonly used. So the same now. Uh, of course, like we always discuss one more thing that is called as how to prevent these conditions, right? So how the prevention can be done. Prevention. So, the most effective way of preventing this condition is what? Eat cooked meat. Or you can say, don't consume raw meat. So, of course, like the cooked meat, the meat should be cooked thoroughly prior to consumption. And good hygiene and good sanitation are highly effective uh, because it is it, like the, the eggs, they go into the stool. So, improve sanitation and that's why you know this condition uh, is most common in what you can say uh, developing countries or poor countries okay uh, so that that's the reason like you know we can we can remove this thing so of course like improvement in sanitation and public health care are very essential in not just controlling these conditions but like many other conditions and nowadays in many, in what you can say, in most of the developed countries, especially, you know, in China, you don't see the wildlife or like the animals on the road, but in many countries, the animals still roam around like normal people, like the cows, the pigs, and you can see them. So, of course, like nowadays, the, they don't allow like the animals like to roam freely around the humans and uh, uh, so that they should come in contact with the human feces. So, of course, like with the animals, like pig or cows cannot come in contact with the human faces due to improved sanitation. So, it reduces the infection from human to pigs or the, from the human to cows, okay? Uh, now, nowadays, you know, there are, they have slaughterhouses, they have meat inspection teams. Of course, in developed countries, okay, uh, there are teams which in inspect the livestock of the countries. Uh, they, they, they don't allow... Uh, illegal trade of livestock by local farmer farmers and uh, <coughs> they give drugs to the animals as well nowadays as well as vaccines are given to the animals of course like to, to control all these infections so that's the important thing okay like this is how we can we can we can uh, stop these infections okay so of course like Improve sanitation, health hygiene, education, all these things can be, uh, can be done, uh, what you can say, for these patients, uh, for the, for like to control these conditions. So, uh, that's all guys, okay. <clears throat> so, remember like cystic cirrhosis and chemiasis, you know, uh, which results from the tapeworm, they are, they affect a lot of people worldwide. And uh, those countries which 
consume more meat or beef cow and pig, you know, they, they get more infections. That's related to these things. So there are many countries, you know, in which like this type of infections are basically uh, what you can say endemic. So thank you so much for listening.